Welcome. Welcome, everyone. It's a great blessing to be with you this evening. Welcome to tonight's Acts 2 workshop, Nutrition, Healthy Eating, and Dementia Caregiving. How to make it work for you and your loved one. I'm Dr. Rob Glukoff, servant leader of the Acts 2 Project and professor, Florida State University College of Medicine. If you're not familiar with the term Acts 2, it stands for African American Alzheimer's Caregiver Training and Support Project 2. I hope and pray, folks, that you will enjoy this workshop and that you will find it highly informative. Before I introduce this evening's presenters, I want to recognize our partners who've contributed both resources and guidance in the development of the Acts 2 Dementia Caregiver Workshop Series. Acts 2 primary collaborators are the African Methodist Episcopal Church, 11th Episcopal District, the Florida State Primitive Baptist Convention, the Florida Progressive Missionary and Educational Baptist Convention, the Florida General Baptist Convention, Florida Department of Elder Affairs and the Florida State University College of Medicine REACH Project. Turning now to tonight's presenters, we have three dynamic speakers, Dr. Lenore Coleman, Dr. Celeste Hart, and Mrs. Tomika Norton-Brown. And I have the distinct privilege of serving as moderator for this evening's workshop. Please permit me to share just a few words about each of, uh, of our presenters. Our first presenter is Dr. Lenore Coleman. She is president of Healing Our Village, an organization providing nationwide diabetes and asthma management, as well as dementia prevention education. She is also executive director of Total Lifestyle Change, a nonprofit organization dedicated to eliminating health their, healthcare disparities among minorities. Dr. Coleman received her Doctor of Pharmacy degree from the University of California, San Francisco, and has been a practicing pharmacist for over 36 years. Dr. Coleman has created Operation Detect a cardiovascular risk reduction program for faith-based and community-based organizations. In addition, she recently initiated an innovative video and radio outreach program known as Village Broadcasting to address the medical, emotional, and social justice issues affecting the African-American community across this country. In her limited spare time, Dr. Coleman enjoys line dancing and traveling. Our second presenter, Dr. Celeste Hart, is owner and chief physician of the North Florida Regional Thyroid Center in Tallahassee with over 35 years of experience. Her areas of, our, of expertise are in diabetes, weight, and high blood pressure management. She received her undergraduate degree from Princeton University and her MD degree from Howard University College of Medicine. Dr. Hart subsequently served on the faculty at Howard University College of Medicine from 19, uh, 1986 to 1980, 1991 as assistant professor of physiology and director of the endocrinology research laboratory. In 1991, she began her practice in Tallahassee, where she also serves as co-medical director of the Tallahassee Memorial Healthcare Diabetes Center. Dr. Hart enjoys quality time, spending quality time with her family and participating in community, community advocacy activities. Last, Dr. Tormika Norton-Brown is project coordinator of the Acts 2 Project. She has worked in the area of survey development and evaluation for over two decades. She has served as a caregiver for her dear aunt and uncle with dementia and has a passion for helping others. Tamika has been a great source of encouragement and support to literally hundreds of family caregivers of older adults with dementia across Florida. Tamika is also a strong leader by example 
in her church community. Folks, during the, the course of the workshop, I encourage you to share questions, sharing questions that will be answered after each presentation using the text message function of Facebook Live. Note also that we will have a 10 minute question and answer period following the third presentation. And now we have Dr. Lenore Coleman. Well, hello, hello to everyone. Um, I am really honored to be here. Um, this is a topic that is uh, close to my heart. Um, I, uh, my mother uh, suffered from vascular dementia. My brother is, uh, is uh, 78 years old and he had a stroke. And so he has a severe short-term memory loss. And so I know how being a caregiver for uh, members in your family, your community, is such an important thing. And so, um, you know, we struggle with trying to figure out how to do the things we need to do for our loved ones. And something that they do, and we hope they do every single day, is eat. And so it's important that as caregivers, we know as much as we can about um, healthy eating, um, nutritional principles that we should employ, um, not only for um, the, the, our elderly and our family that we're taking care of, but for ourselves. Because as caregivers, um, we have to be able to live a long life as well, so we can be there to take care of our, our family and our friends and our loved ones. So when I was asked by Acts 2 to give this, this presentation, I was, I was excited to do it. Um, Healing Our Village spends a lot of time with um, mostly people with diabetes and cardiovascular disease, um, helping them to eat healthy. Um, I did a presentation um, a couple of days ago for the CDC, and in preparation for that uh, presentation, I actually looked at the latest obesity statistics. And we are now up to two out of every three adults in the United States are overweight. So we as a country are not eating healthy and we're not doing what we need to do to, um, to live a long and, and healthy life. So I, this topic was very interesting to me. And so thank you so much again for the opportunity to share uh, what I've learned over the 40 plus years that I've been taking care of patients with chronic diseases. Next slide. So we wanted to start off with just sort of uh, getting us all on the same page. Um, with a few definitions. So what is dementia? So dementia basically is a general term for progressive loss of memory and other mental functions. It is severe enough actually uh, to, when it gets to its later stages to interfere with what they call our activities of daily living. So this is something that um, many people have here in this country. Um, we're probably seeing it more and more because we know more of what it looks like. So um, that's sort of the standard and going definition of dementia. Next slide. So when you talk about dementia, most everyone thinks of it as loss of memory. So this actually needs to be present in order for you to, to have a working diagnosis of dementia. But there are some other symptoms that may or may not be present. So they may have language problems, being able to articulate and express their feelings, um, trouble taking care of themselves and just doing their daily chores. And I, I know for both my mom and my brother, that's the hardest thing. Things that they used to not have to think about that just came so easy. Now takes a little bit of thinking and a little bit of planning. And so that's sometimes very difficult for many, many patients. Um, using familiar objects incorrectly. Um, personality changes. Some of you who are caretakers have noticed that um, a lot of your um, family members or folks that are suffering from dementia, they're just not the same as they were 10 years ago, 20 years ago. So their personality has changed. You know, dealing with chronic diseases, dealing with chronic conditions, it's stressful. And so we have to understand that we have to be forgiving, we have to be open, we have to be patient. Um, you know, patience is a virtue. And so I continue to work every day to try to increase my, my patience level. And working with folks that have dementia and other sorts of chronic diseases will actually help you to do that. 
Um, they may have impaired judgment, insight, um, some issues with abstract reasoning, which is called our executive function, uh, negative impact on their social functioning. So uh, in the case of my brother, uh, he has always had a dry wit. And so now when he makes in jokes and, and says certain things, people take offense to it. So he's having a harder time sort of blending in and, and dealing in social um, situations that he had uh, before he had his stroke. And then not do necessarily the things like depression or medications. A lot of people think that this is what we, we are experienced, but that's not necessarily the case. Next slide, please. So when you talk about the, the umbrella of dementia, there are several different conditions that sort of fall under that umbrella. Now, we know, of course, that Alzheimer's represents the majority of that. That's about 60 to 80 percent. But there's Lewy body um, dementia, which is five to 10 percent. My mother actually had vascular dementia, um, which is also in that five to 10 percent um, category. And then there's sometimes mixed dementia. So um, uh, oftentimes we, we look at people who have Parkinson's or, or uh, Huntington's um, disease. All of these are sort of under this umbrella because they do have, in some cases, that central feature of loss of memory. Next slide, please. Now, I spend my entire life and most of my career on risk factor reduction. If we were able to decrease these risk factors, we would be able to have a lot less of the chronic conditions that we're dealing with. Um, we could be able to prevent some of those conditions from occurring. And so it's important that you know some of the risk factors for dementia. As I told you, I spent a lot of my life in the area of diabetes, um, obesity and overweight, high blood pressure and other types of cardiovascular disease like heart failure. Um, and I also spend a lot of, of work with seniors. As people get older, um, these risk factors tend to, to pop up. I was in the, the waiting room uh, with my brother a couple, of, a couple of days ago, and there was a patient in there, and he was looking real snazzy. He was dressed up, had his hat on and some fancy shoes, and he struck up a conversation with me. And he said, you know, as you get older, you know, things that you used to do, you can't do. And I never expected to be feeling like I'm feeling. And I said to him, you know, sir, um, this is just part of getting older. And, and God bless you that you're here and that you're able to get older. So that's the first thing. And secondly, you know, you are in control of your risk factors. You're in control of what you eat and how much you eat. You're in control of your environment and things that's make you stressed and so can may make your blood pressure go up. You're in control of how much exercise you get. So if you're not getting any exercise, you're not getting in your uh, 10,000 steps a day. And let me tell you that 10,000 steps a day is hard to get. Um, those kinds of things are, are a risk factor for dementia, but also for the diabetes and the, and the high blood pressure. All of these risk factors, many of them go hand in hand. Um, other risk factors include limited intellectual stimulation and activities. I just had a conversation with my brother yesterday about he, he needs to get out and get to the senior center so he could play some pool. He might not remember where he parked his car, but he definitely remembers how to play pool. And uh, the guys at the senior center are waiting for him to come so they can challenge him to a pool game. A family history of dementia. We know there is some genetic predisposition to that. And also uh, um, uh, apolipoprotein E gene, which is part of that genetic transmission as it relates to cholesterol transport protein. Next slide. So I actually, as I was doing and preparing for this talk, uh, found um, a, my a my plate picture for older adults. So this is right out there on the website. I'm sure that uh, Act 2 uh, will share these slides with you as well and the links that are available. So I just thought we'd kind of go through this plate and talk about the different food groups. So let's start off with protein. It's very important that you get your protein, especially as you get older. Um, protein is what builds muscle, and it's important that you keep your muscle mass. So strong and healthy. So in order to do that, you have to have your fish, you have to have your chicken, um, you have to have your beef, you have to have your protein. Many older um, individuals 
they don't like eating meat anymore because they have, especially beef and lamb pork because they have to chew so much they may have dentures so that might be a little bit of a problem but we but if you can't get it your protein in by getting your meats there are other ways you can drink protein shakes etc so but you got to get your protein dairy really important because dairy many like milk and yogurt they all have calcium and calcium is important for bone for bone growth and for bone strength. So it's important that you get your, your dairy in because of the calcium. But you know, you also need that vitamin D because it's the vitamin D that helps the calcium get in the bone. So I recommend that all everybody, but definitely my seniors, get at least 20 minutes of sunshine a day. It's really important to get outside, breathe from fresh air, and get some sunshine. We need our grains. And so we're looking at whole grains as much as we can. We need our fluids. A lot of times, many, many of our elderly um, seniors have dehydration because they sort of forget to drink. So the way, the trick to do that is whenever you sit down to have your breakfast, your lunch, your dinner, your snack, pour yourself a glass of water so you can have something to drink along with that snack or that meal. And then you'll be able to get closer to your six to eight glasses of, of water per day. Now, I'm really into... Uh, the natural ways of cooking, growing your own herbs and spices. Um, I went next door. Uh, my next door neighbor actually cuts my hair. I'm blessed. And uh, before she, I left the, uh, her house, she took me out to her herb and spice garden. Now, I was expecting this to be in the ground because that's what I, when people say garden to me, that's what I think. But she actually had everything in pots. And she had some planters that were actually elevated. So she didn't have to bend over to get to the plants. And I thought that was very creative. So in a very small corner of her, of her backyard, she had her herb and spice garden. So, we, so those things are good. It makes the food taste better. It helps with the, um, the, the flavoring of the food. And it also helps you reduce your salt intake, which we'll talk a little bit about later. In terms of the oils that you should be cooking with, you should be cooking with vegetable oils, canola oil. Um, you should not be cooking with, uh, with oils that are solid. So back in the good old days, we used to use um, solid lard and, and other solid um, greases to cook our foods and to fry our foods. But those are not what we want to do now because they are high in what we call saturated fat. And saturated fat is not good for your cholesterol and cholesterol is not good for your blood vessels. So that's why healthy oils are really important. Um, people talk about olive oil, the, uh, co coconut oil. Some of that's part of the Mediterranean diet. So we recommend all of that. And then the fruits and vegetables. It's important that you not eliminate fruits and vegetables from your diet. You really need the vegetables. The vegetables are the fiber. Fruits give you, some fruits give you fiber and you need that fiber. Fiber is what helps your digestion. But also if you have diabetes, fiber helps keep down your blood sugar. So you, we always talk about trying to get to five. We need to arrive at five, which means eating at least five fruits and vegetables throughout the day, which is very difficult to do unless you're eating some fruit or some vegetable and almost every meal, and you're adding in your fruits and vegetables as part of your snacks. So that's how you're able to arrive at five. Next slide. So when I talk to my patients about getting started, because we all have to just get started, what we need to start thinking about is what foods are high in calories and what foods are low in calories. So we want to eat more of the foods that are low in calories, like apples and grapes, and pears, um, peas and beans, lentils, um, foods that are high in water content or fiber, and then your whole grains, your lettuce, your cucumbers. Those are great snacks. You can always make yourself, if you're hungry and you're trying to decrease your, your calorie intake, you can always have a salad if you're hungry. But you got to avoid these foods that are high in calories. So your um, cheddar cheese, your whole milk, your fried chicken, um, cakes, cookies, ice creams, um, salad dressings. You know, some of you like to go and now that we're uh, having some a little bit more freedom, we're going back to our restaurants that have salad bars 
And so by the time you get from one end of the salad bar to the other end of the salad bar, this salad that should be about 200 calories is 2000 calories because you put on everything you can on that on that salad. And then when you get to the end, you take the whole ladle of salad dressing and you pour it over the salad. And that now increases those calories. So when we're starting on our, our eating plan, where we're trying to eat healthy, trying to focusing on those foods low in calories versus uh, those foods that are high in calories. And those foods that are high in calories, you need to eat small amounts. Next slide, please. So there, uh, we're going to go through some just basic guidelines for healthy eating. So when I, I got my, my my haircut, you know, when people go to the hairdresser at the barbershop, you, you learn a lot of stuff. See, I, I'm one of those people who talk to everybody. And so I always like to hear people's perspective. So she started telling me the fact that she called her cousin and told her cousin that because of COVID and not getting her daily exercise, because she used to go to the gym every day, she was weighing 175 pounds. And that was her number. Everybody has a number that when you get on that scale and you see that number, that's when you get off the scale and say, okay, today's the day I'm starting. No more excuses. So her number was 175. So she then two weeks later weighed 168. I said, wow, what did you do? And this is what she said. She stopped eating so much. Pretty simple. <laughs> she cut her portions down. So she ate smaller servings of all the food, but definitely smaller servings of her of the meat, fish, and, and chicken that she was eating. And she ate more fish and more chicken throughout the week. She started to roast and bake and grill her food. Um, uh, I have a, a, a George Foreman. Um, and so that's the way I, I eat my food. I avoid the fried foods because I now have an air fryer. And I'm telling you that air fryer tastes just like you fried it, but the calories are half the amount. So these sort of creative ways to bake, grill, air fry your foods. So you're not adding fat to your, to your foods is very important. Again, eliminating butter, um, margarine, just having small amounts. Um, a lot of you love nuts. Nuts are healthy, but you can only have a handful. You can't eat the whole can of nuts while you're watching television. Okay, that you can't do that. Next slide, please. Um, we talked about milk. Dairy is critical. We want you to do 1% or 2% or skim milk if, if, you, can, if you can tolerate it. Um, the ice cream, you know, so I, I, I know people sometimes get depressed and they go and they get those big uh, gallons of ice cream, quarts of ice cream, and they eat the whole thing. OK, um, getting the ice cream out of your freezer and going to get a spoon is not what we want you to do. So if you're going to eat any of that, we should try to eat yogurt, frozen yogurt if you can. But if you're going to have ice cream, you need to have a small amount. So you got to put it out of the container into a bowl. Sour cream, um, all of those are high fat dairy. We want to avoid those. Snacking. I'm a snacker. I love to snack. So I usually use a popcorn. Um, I go and I buy the 100 calorie snacks in the grocery store. They're already packaged in 100 calorie bags. But dried fruit is, is good. Um, uh, cr crackers, but you could only have a few. Um, all of those are the, what I usually do when I want to have a snack. In terms of nonstick cooking ware, I threw, I threw all my pots and pans away. And I went out and bought me a brand new set of those pots and pans that they're advertising now. And it is amazing how the, the, the food just doesn't stick. And it, they're also easier to clean. So I suggest all of you go out there and get a good set of nonstick pans. And we already talked about the vegetable oils, or I actually use the vegetable oil cooking spray. So that's what I usually use for sauteing my, my food. Next slide, please. We eat too much salt, full stop. We are eating about eight to 12 grams of salt a day because we're eating canned foods, um, com fast foods, convenient foods, microwave foods. So we're getting way too much salt. We get about 10% of our salt from natural sources 75% added when we're eating processed foods, 
15% is added to your diet when you're, when you're cooking um, uh, the food. You should not be using salt to cook at all. And then table salt. Some of you start sprinkling the salt on and you haven't even tasted the food to see if it needs the salt. So take the salt shaker off the table. And then one teaspoon is about 2,400 milligrams. So that's all of the salt you're supposed to have per day, per day. Especially if you have high blood pressure, especially if you have kidney disease. And as you get older, your kidneys, you know, just start to slow down. They don't work quite as well. Um, in fact, we're starting a campaign where we're making sure that all patients, when they go see their doctor, they're asking their doctor, what is my GFR? What is my, how are my kidneys doing? You need to walk into that doctor's office. You've gotten your blood work done. You need to ask that doctor, how are my kidneys doing? Next slide. Now, how do you reduce your salt intake? Well, again, not using it during cooking, not putting it on the, on the table and, or put it on your food before you taste it, substituting herbs and spices and other food flavorings and eating less salty food. So I tell people all the time, take those potato chips that you love and the corn chips, put them on a napkin, leave them there for a minute and then lift it up. And that napkin will be full of oil and salt. So Potato chips, corn chips, all of that stuff has a lot of salt. Um, we used to, in the good old days, cook our greens and, and et cetera with salt pork. Can't do that anymore. Got to use turkey, ham hocks, a lot of salt because they're cured. My favorite is dill pickles. Right? You can't eat a whole lot of dill pickles. They got a lot of salt um, and canned foods. Now, you know, one of the things I do if I'm using some canned food is I will pour off the juice that's in the can and then rinse it. So I'm rinsing off all of the salt that was on that, 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 that those uh, beans or whatever vegetables were sitting in. Next slide, please. So many people that have dementia have a poor appetite. So let's figure out why that might be. Well, the first is they might not recognize the food. So they may no longer recognize what you're putting on your plate. They might not know that you're actually giving them their favorite food. So you have to let them know when you put the plate in front of them, what's on the plate. Um, poor fitting dentures that can make eating painful or they're not able to chew the meat or the, the chewier foods. So you got to make sure that if they need dentures, that they have good fitting dentures and they've seen their dentist regularly. They also may have gotten a decreased sense of smell and or taste. So a person with dementia might not eat the food because they can't smell it. You know, your appetite is enhanced by your smell and by your taste. When you taste something and it's really good, it enhances your appetite. But if you can't smell and you can't taste, then you start to lose your appetite. One of the most important things with our seniors is that we must make sure they are eating and that they're getting their calories in every day. Next slide, please. Now, medications, there are some medications that can decrease your appetite. If a person's starting a brand new medication or the medication they're on, the doses has been increased, then you, and all of a sudden their appetite's not the same, let the doctor know. If you notice a change, you've got to tell the doctor. And then not enough exercise. You know, if you get that walking in, if you get outside with some fresh air, it actually exercise increases your appetite because exercise burns calories and your, your body is like a machine. So when you burn those calories, then the body starts to want to get those calories back. And so it will make you hungry. Your brain will let your body know it needs to be fed. So exercise is a good way to increase someone's um, uh, appetite. Also, they can just do simple things like walking or gardening. Um, I, I actually cut my own lawn, believe it or not. Most people have gardeners. I like cutting my lawn because that's how I get my steps in. So I can actually, if I spend the whole day or two or three hours out in the yard, I will get my 10,000 steps. Just cleaning up around the house, washing dishes, all of those are ways to get your exercise in. If you have a favorite television show, instead of fast forwarding through the commercials, 
Stay, let, watch the commercials and get up and walk in place right there while you're watching the commercials. All of this is a ways to get moving. Next slide. Um, make meal times calm and comfortable. So during the middle stages of Alzheimer's, you can't have a lot of distractions. You can't have a lot of choices. So you limit the distractions by having meals in a quiet surrounding, away from the television and other distractions. You may have some you know, nice music playing if they have a special type of music that they like. But in terms of having that TV on, you should limit that. Uh, keep the table uh, setting simple. If they only need a fork, and that's all they need to eat, then just have the four. Um, avoid patterned plates and tablecloths and placements. Kind of keep the color scheme simple. Try to contrast the plates with the tablecloth, if at all possible. Next slide. In terms of preparing the table, again, um, use a, a, a nice tablecloth, napkins. If they need an apron to put on so that it'll make cleanup easier for you as a caretaker, then do that. Get some kind of, a, of an apron that, that that's kind of fun. They enjoy putting it on. Distinguish food from the plate. We talked about that by using different colors. So let's say you got your orange carrots and your green broccoli and your your chicken that that is a, 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 a beige color. Try to change things up so when they look at the plate, they'll be able to distinguish the food. And then check the temperature, of course, because you don't want them eating thing, anything too hot. Next slide. Um, offer one food item at a time. Sort of do it the way you get it at the restaurant. So you, you maybe you have your caregivers, or if you're the caregiver, give them in, in courses um, so that they um, they they're able to to get uh, you know more variety in their dinner menu. Be flexible. Listen, if they want to have waffles for dinner, let them have waffles for dinner. I, I don't care what you want. Whatever you want, I'm going to make it. So that that is very important to be flexible. And then allow plenty of time for them to eat, keeping in mind that it can take an hour or more for that person to finish. Next slide. Minimize the eating and nutritional problems, um, preparing foods that aren't hard to chew and swallow. We talked about that. So you can grind them up or cut them into small pieces. Um, using foods like applesauce, cottage cheese, scrambled eggs, all of those are easy er, for um, people to eat. Um, know the signs of choking and everybody in your family needs to know the signs of choking, but avoid foods that are difficult to chew like raw carrots because sometimes they can't break up the pieces. And then address a, uh, a, a decreased diet appetite. Sometimes you, there's uh, you have to use a supplement like Boost or Insure. Um, and if it gets really bad, there are medications out there that you can get your doctor to prescribe that will increase their appetite. And let me tell you, those medications really work. Next slide, please. So again, eating together in, in a comfortable environment. You know, our, our seniors are used to having dinner at the table with the whole family gathered around. We don't do that now. We sort of eat in front of the television. Everybody's eating on the go. So eating together, if it's possible, uh, or if you're a caregiver, make that sort of part of the caregiving duties that you have. And then having finger foods for them to munch on, nuggets, fish sticks, sandwiches, things that are, again, in, in bite-side pieces, steamed broccoli, steamed cauliflower, all of those, again, are, are things that they can pick up and just kind of chew on that are easy to swallow. Next slide. So in summary, just some general recommendations. Um, if you, if for our seniors, most of them are not overweight, but if you are overweight, you need to know what your body mass index is, your BMI. That is a calculation of your weight, height, and fat ratio. Everybody needs to be down below 30 um, to be, uh, so we, we actually, when you get higher than about 25, 27 in the, your BMI, that means you're starting to tend toward being overweight. Um, we have people with BMIs of 50 and 60. So we are the probably, the, as a country, the biggest we have ever been. Um, you need to try to have them uh, eat a balanced diet with all the food groups represented, low in saturated fats, low in cholesterol, 
um, include a variety of grains. If you ask me what, what white rice or, or, or brown rice, I'm going to tell you brown rice. If you ask me white bread versus wheat bread, I'm going to tell you wheat bread. So you need to increase those whole grains. We talked about how to get to five uh, vegetables and, and fruits um, a day. Things need to be low sugar. You need to read your labels. You need to understand your nutrition facts. And so work with a dietitian to be able to, to figure that out or just, there's many, many books and there's all sorts of stuff online that teaches you how to read a label on your food products. Um, low sodium, we talked about that. And then not more than one alcoholic drink per day. So that's about four ounces. Um, you know, I, I, I'm a wine person. So if I'm gonna have an alcoholic drink, it's usually red wine because it's good for the heart. Um, and, you know, the, in the blue zones, there are five countries in the, in the world where people routinely live to be 100. And in all of those places, they drink wine. So they're doing something right. Of course, they also walk and they have fresh air and they eat very healthy diets. So it's not just the wine. Next slide. If you're not sure what to do, schedule an appointment to see a dietitian or a nutritionist. It really will help you figure out what foods your 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 client needs to to eat um the how to be, be, basically build a meal plan that they'll actually comply with so i really recommend that all of us um see a dietitian next slide i want to thank you so much for allowing me to uh, pr present today and i hope that was beneficial to you thank you so much dr coleman that was comprehensive down to earth, so helpful. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you very much. I believe we have time for maybe uh, uh, one or two questions. So uh, first, uh, May Andrews wants to give you an affirmation. Great information, very helpful, Dr. Coleman. Thank you, May Andrews. May also has another question. Is dementia hereditary? Yeah, the, with the certain based upon the type of dementia we're talking about, there seems to be a hereditary um, uh, component. Yes. One of the things that I struggle with with my brother is that my brother had a stroke, so he has memory loss because of the stroke. But my brother does not have dementia, so people confuse that all the time. All right. So you know, my brother says, "Oh, you know, Lenore, you're going to get the same thing I have." I said, no, no, because I'm not going to have a stroke. <laughs> I want to keep my blood pressure low. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Coleman. Uh, once again, folks, we will have a question and answer period where we will be able to field questions uh, that Dr. Coleman uh, can respond to and others on the panel. And next we have Dr. Celeste Hart. Welcome, welcome, Dr. Hart. We're so grateful to have you here today. Thank you. It's such a pleasure for me to have this opportunity to talk to those heroes who are out there caring for their loved ones. I know it's a labor of love and it's something that you uh, really want very much to do, but I also know it's very challenging and uh, so many of my patients have loved ones that come in with them and have uh, very busy lives. So thank you for all that you do. I'll tell you from firsthand experience over the past 40 years that you make an enormous difference. Uh, my patients who come in with a loved one on a regular basis just seem to do better in my experience. Next slide. Uh, and you can go next slide, please. I, I really decided that I would limit my comments to patients with diabetes because, uh, well, because that's my experience. Uh, but numerically, patients with di diabetes make up an outsized portion of uh, patients with dementia. Uh, so, for example, patients with Alzheimer's disease, 60% uh, of them have diabetes. Uh, patients with mild cognitive impairment um, uh, form part of that group. And then diabetes uh, is a disease of the vasculature, and vascular dementia is more common in people with diabetes. So uh, diabetes uh, can be a precursor 
to dementia in many instances. Next slide. Uh, diabetes is known for the uh, bad company that it keeps. So in our country, the vast majority of people with diabetes have the adult onset form. It's called type 2 diabetes. And it's usually accompanied by hypertension, high blood pressure, and 60 to 80 percent by obesity in 70 to 80 percent of people with type 2 diabetes because of the obesity, perhaps, but also because of the inflammatory nature of diabetes. There's an increased risk for arthritis. Uh, high cholesterol is another frequent accompaniment. Um, many people with diabetes have sleep apnea. It's really important to screen for and think about so that uh, uncontrolled diabetes can cause a lot of fatigue and daytime sleepiness, but sleep apnea can also contribute to that. It can raise the blood pressure. It can increase the risk of cardiovascular disease, heart attack, uh, and stroke. And so it's really important to screen for and treat appropriately because if you do so, you can limit all of those things. You can improve the blood pressure. Uh, you can um, enhance efforts at weight loss and uh, diabetes control frequently improves secondarily. Uh, people with diabetes can have liver disease. They have fatty liver. Uh, and it's another thing that we screen for regularly in clinic. Uh, but complicates the management of the disease. Next slide. The common complications of diabetes, most frequent, the thing that is going to cut life short, lifespan short, if anything does in diabetes is heart attack and stroke. Uh, diabetes is the number one cause of kidney failure that can lead to dialysis. Eye disease, it's the number one cause of blindness outside of trauma. It can lead to neurologic impairment. So people with diabetes have a neurologic condition commonly called peripheral neuropathy. Uh, so that all of these <clears throat> aren't just part of a mundane list. These things really color the life of a person with diabetes and um, make it difficult and challenging sometimes to care for them. Uh, and the neurologic impairment can include loss of sensation. Uh, that predisposes to foot ulcers because the patient doesn't know sometimes how they're planting their feet, so they, it impairs gait. Uh, they don't sense uh, injury to their feet early, so uh, they can have injury that goes untreated and unrecognized and can lead to foot ulceration. Uh, and ultimately, that can lead to amputation. So it can be really, really challenging and uh, to care for people with this uh, multiplicity of different medical complications. In addition, uh, each of these other medical problems can be a reason that we end up putting people on medication. So people with diabetes are frequently on multiple, multiple medications, and the medications can add further to some of the complications and, and um, challenges of caring for them, uh, not only because of the number of different medicines, but because they can uh, interact and have a number of side effects that can uh, exacerbate some of the other problems that we'll talk about. Next slide. One of the things that has become clear to me over the years is that dementia doesn't have an on or off switch. So something that evolves gradually in most cases. And in many cases, I see that uh, the patient has developed some memory lapse and some poor habits that the family members are just not attuned to early on. So for example, I had a patient a few weeks ago, she's been under my care for 15 or 20 years for both diabetes and thyroid disease. And it came to a point where we were having a really hard time helping her control her thyroid disease. Her level would be too high, then it would be too low, and we were adjusting up and down. And it became clear over several dose adjustments that she was just forgetting to take it. Indeed, one day she came in and her face was very swollen and droopy. I worried that she might have had a stroke and sent her to the emergency room, only to find that she'd missed her thyroid medicine for a few months. 
And normally her daughter who cares for her is very astute and would have picked up on something like that. But because her mother is generally a very independent and proud woman, I think she had been a little hesitant to jump in. So it's important to realize the symptoms of dementia and realize some of the manifestations and be alert to those so that you can intervene at the appropriate time before there's uh, real trouble in the offing. Uh, a frequent problem in my clinic for people with dementia is that they forget insulin doses. Uh, I've had people double up and take two doses and cause dangerously low blood sugar uh, so that as the dementia advances, diabetes control deteriorates. And as the diabetes control deteriorates, the dementia accelerates. So it can be a real vicious cycle. So it's important to realize this and to look for those signs early so that you can jump in and get help from your medical team. Next slide. So we've already heard a lot about nutrition. I'm not going to... Uh, I'm going to try to avoid repeating what some of what you've already heard, but there are some particular uh, aspects of nutrition that uh, relate to diabetes care late in life and people who have dementia that I thought I'd bring up to you next slide. Uh, we've talked about lack of appetite. So you transition from a period where uh, you've been encouraging someone to eat less uh, and notice over time that they're losing weight rapidly uh, and it's time to kind of change strategy and realize that their nutritional needs are no longer being met. Next slide. Um, so we've talked about some of the things that can lead to poor appetite. Uh, advanced cognitive decline was mentioned um, by Dr. Coleman. Uh, there are endocrine disorders, uh, rare ones, but endocrine disorders that can lead to poor appetite. So I mention that because it's important to get a full medical evaluation when weight loss seems to be accelerating. Uh, we've mentioned that many medicines that we prescribe, some medicines to help control mood uh, and uh, affect will impair appetite. Uh, and it's a uh, Particularly important to mention that these medicines frequently cause dry mouth and dental problems. Dental problems were uh, mentioned earlier as a contributor, but sometimes those are a byproduct of some of the decongestants and some of the uh, antidepressants and mood altering drugs that we have to prescribe to our patients. And uh, they can, people with diabetes already have a proclivity to develop. Uh, dental problems uh, because of all the extra sugar in their system, uh, but then these medicines that cause dry mouth can aggravate that, and they can aggravate poor appetite. People with diabetes can have a nervous, a neurological problem that leads to poor digestion. It's called uh, gastroparesis, and it's a slowing of uh, movement of food through the stomach. Uh, and can cause bloating, gas, um, and in particular, these people will have what's called early satiety. So whereas they could sit down and eat a full plate of food, uh, they find that they are full easily and uh, stay full for hours. Uh, another symptom can be that in the morning they're still kind of belching and coughing up things that were consumed the night before, so something to look out for. Next slide. Next slide. So some of the consequences of poor nutrition, we talked earlier about muscle wasting. Muscle wasting is a consequence of aging anyway, uh, but if you're losing weight in, in an accelerated fashion, you're going to lose much more muscle than fat. So if you're making an effort to lose weight and you're losing that pound or two per week that healthcare professionals usually suggest is prudent, uh, you'll lose muscle, you'll lose 
fat and maybe in relatively equal quantities, but when weight loss accelerates and you're losing three or four pounds a week, when I have a patient come in, I had somebody yesterday who had lost 60 pounds over the past eight months. When you're losing that quickly, you lose muscle disproportionately, and that can lead to weakness and fragility, frequent falls, poor skin integrity, and a tendency to foot foot ulcers and other pressure sores. And it can also lead to bone loss and fractures. So uh, you want to invoke some of those tips Dr. Coleman gave you to prevent weight loss when it's occurring at that rate. Next slide. And then one of the uh, problems of poor appetite that's particular to people with diabetes is hypoglycemia or low blood sugar. Uh, it's a consequence of poor appetite in combination with a lot of the drugs that we prescribe for diabetes, in particular insulin. And then there's a class of drugs called sulfonylureas. They're very long-acting drugs. Some examples are glimepuride, glimepuride, gliburide, uh, glipizide. Uh, they're used frequently because they're very cost effective and they have been around for a long time. We feel comfortable using them. But in patients with uh, poor appetite, and then on top of that, because of their diabetes, perhaps some decline in kidney function, uh, these drugs can cause dangerous and deadly low blood sugar. So it's important to know the symptoms and it's important to know how to treat low blood sugar. Um, so sugar is the main fuel that our brain uses for energy. And so we've developed a system to alert us that our blood sugar is dropping and to spur us on to eat to get it back up again. Uh, so you have symptoms that include nervousness, anxiety, your heart begins to race, you may be drenched in sweat. If it occurs at night, which is particularly dangerous because our cognitive function is impaired because we're so sleepy. And then if you have poor memory on top of that, nighttime low blood sugar is particularly dangerous. Uh, but at night, if it happens, the symptoms can include uh, drenching night sweats and uh, nightmares. So if um, you notice that a loved one is drenched in sweat uh, or wakes up with nightmares, think about low blood sugar if they're on medication for diabetes. And please alert your healthcare team to that possibility. You should know how to treat it if your family member is on blood sugar lowering medications. And the therapy is just simply sugar to get the blood sugar back up. Simple sugar is best. So the things we discourage in general, so hard candy is good, uh, jelly beans, you wanna make sure you don't give somebody something they can't swallow easily. So especially in the middle of the night, somebody's confused, maybe slowly uh, encourage fruit juice, uh, cake decorating, icing, the gel that comes in a tube is good because if you squeeze that into their cheek and kind of massage it in, it'll be absorbed well without them having to swallow. If they're confused and you can't seem to rouse them, call 911 immediately. If this is a problem, uh, healthcare providers really want to hear from you. Don't let it happen twice before you let us know so that we can adjust medication. Uh, next slide, please. We talked about loss of sense of smell and how smell and taste go hand in hand. Uh, next slide. We talked about the importance of hydration and, and impaired thirst can be a problem for people with uh, advanced cognitive decline. And uh, diabetes, if it's poorly controlled, can increase the need for fluid because high blood sugar can induce extra or an increase in urine outflow. Uh, many of our patients are on, they have high blood pressure, they have heart problems, they're on diuretics. Uh, drugs that cause increased urine output. So it's important to make sure we're balancing that by en encouraging uh, fluid during the day. Next slide. 
Uh, we talked about the benefits of dairy products. They can include protein. They uh, have a lot of calcium. But many people, as they get older, get lactose intolerance, and that can cause digestive symptoms that may impair appetite over time. So you may want to try eliminating diet uh, dietary dairy products dairy products for a while if uh, your family member seems to have a lot of gas and bloating uh, and uh, there are certainly um, uh, remedies uh, lactate is one uh, that helps uh, people who are deficient in that enzyme to uh, metabolize lactose next slide um, and I will go to the next slide please uh, yeah, and then some vegetables uh, are particularly hard to di digest, and you should be aware of that Dr. Coleman talked about the importance of uh, portion size and cutting things into fine uh, portions that somebody can handle. So not handing somebody a large slice of carrot if they don't have the capacity to chew that and swallow it. But remember that certain vegetables whether uh, are just hard to digest. So some of the things that are in that group are the crucifer vegetables. I chose this illustration because I really like the beautiful color and the texture, but I looked at it later and realized that it had all the vegetables that are particularly difficult to digest among those cauliflower, uh, broccoli, cabbage, um, Brussels sprouts, uh, peppers, onions. So you may want to think about minimizing those or experimenting and to see if those are difficult for your loved one to digest, if they're having a lot of digestive issues that may be interfering with their appetite. Next slide. And I think Dr. Uh, Coleman covered this really well, ways to make things appealing. Uh, and so we'll go to the next slide. Uh, and then just another shout out and appeal from me to please get actively involved in your loved one's care. If you notice that their medical regimen is becoming overwhelming and they're having a harder and harder time seeming to understand it all, there's nothing like having you there in the clinic, next slide, so that you can observe Report to me some of the things that you might be observing in your loved one, some of the things that are going on. Uh, sometimes I'll be getting a medical history and the loved one's sitting there, and they may be off to the side out of their loved one's eye shot. They'll be shaking their head, telling me, no, that's not what she does. That's not what happens. Uh, so your ob observations are incredibly important. Uh, a lot of patients are kind of sheepish about going online and back-checking doctor's advice. I encourage it, uh, but I uh, admonish you that there are helpful websites and there are lay people who really don't have the training uh, and even people who've been trained but haven't vetted their information carefully. So you want to look for reliable sites. You want to look for the big university site, the Harvard University Medical Letter. The National Institutes of Health has wonderful health care information, the Mayo Clinic, uh, the large voluntary health organizations, the American Diabetes Association, the American Heart Association. Uh, there's plenty out there. If you get a little nervous about your insulin injection technique, for example, these large organizations uh, and even the pharmaceutical companies that manufacture the medicines have videos you can watch on um, online to help you refresh your technique because all these beautiful expensive medicines that we uh, prescribe for patients uh, don't work at all if they're not administered correctly so make sure your technique is good and kind of watch your loved one and make sure his or her technique is good as well next slide uh, because diabetes care is so complex these days, it's really crucial to maintain records and lists. Next slide. Uh, it helps to have each drug, the date it was started. If a drug was stopped, don't take it off the list. Strike through it so I know it's been tried before. List by prescriber. So if I see that the kidney doctor has prescribed a certain 
blood pressure medicine, uh, and I'm concerned about the impact that it may be having on your diabetes, I know who to talk to about thinking about an alternative. Understand carefully how each drug in the list is to be dosed. Um, learn how to administer it correctly and carefully cross check for allergies. There's so many drugs that uh, are in a category that it's hard to know sometimes if your loved one is, admit, is allergic to one drug, if they're going to have problems with another. You just don't know if the other drug is in the same category sometimes if you don't ask. So it's reasonable every time a new drug is prescribed to say, now you remember, Doc, she's allergic to uh, ACE inhibitors. This isn't an ACE inhibitor, is it? Uh, and, and just jog our memories. Uh, it, you can't be too careful. Next slide. And this is an example of a medicine list. Uh, it helps me if you type it out, thanks. Next slide. And then organizing the medicines to be administered in a pill reminder is uh, a really helpful manipulation to help the, your loved one uh, take their medicines on time and on schedule. Uh, this is a daily reminder kit but they can be three-dimensional. So if you're taking medicines morning, noon, and nighttime, uh, the medicines can be all lined up by day of the week and time of day. Next slide. Uh, monitoring is really crucial for patients with diabetes, especially if they're on blood sugar lowering medications. And it's always helpful to bring the glucose meter into the office with you, if possible, Many offices can download those, but it's so much more helpful to see the data line by line, item by item, than to just hear your general description. I get so much more out of it. Next slide. There are newer devices for glucose monitoring, and especially for people who are have are having problems with frequent low blood sugar, it's nice to have these glucose sensors. What these devices do is to measure blood sugar every five minutes, 24 seven around the clock. They have alerts so that if the blood sugar drops during the night, uh, the, uh, uh, an alarm goes off and alerts the patient. Moreover, you can see a blood sugar, uh, um, graph on that screen that she's holding up and that graph can be transmitted electronically to a loved one so if you're taking care of your mom and you know that uh, she's on medicine that tends to cause her blood sugar to dip a little in the late afternoon you can watch what's going on the alert can come to your cell phone and you can intervene before she gets into trouble next slide so uh, in summary, uh, your loved one's lives can be enhanced greatly by the efforts that you make to continue to keep their uh, health problems in check. This can be a wonderfully rewarding period of life. This can be uh, a beautiful time of life for them. Even though they can't do all the things they want to do, they can't remember things as sharply as they once did, uh, but you'll observe that they're still the person you knew in many ways uh, 20 or 40 years ago. Um, and so uh, I encourage you and I thank you on their behalf for all you do. Uh, it can be challenging, but the rewards are certainly uh, immense. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Hart. Uh, just wanted to uh, to to give you a few uh, questions uh, that folks brought to the table, as well as affirmations. Annie Knight has uh, asked you if you were once on diabetic medication for many years and your doctor says you no longer need the meds because your numbers are good, what should you look for in the future? Great question. Uh, my favorite thing to do is take somebody off medicine because they have altered their lifestyle, uh, become more physically active, they're eating a more healthful diet and they don't need it anymore. 
Uh, but they still have to be monitored. We haven't cured their diabetes. We've reversed it perhaps temporarily, but it can come back. And so it's important to continue. Your doctor may decide with you that you don't need to keep checking your blood sugar with a meter, uh, but you do need to come in periodically to have testing done to make sure that without the medicine, you're remaining in good control. Sometimes if your kidneys begin to malfunction, the kidneys, since the kidneys are important for clearing insulin, uh, if they slow down, you may not need diabetes medicines anymore. Uh, so sometimes there can be an unhappy reason for it. Uh, and there's some medicines that we don't administer to people whose kidneys have slowed down. So I had a patient today, I had to take off the drug metformin. Uh, so there are a number of reasons that people come off medicine, uh, but it just doesn't mean that their diabetes has been cured and ongoing monitoring is important. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Hart. Uh, as I said before, we're going to have a, a time for a few questions after Tamika Norton's presentation. Outstanding, outstanding job in linking Dr. Hart diabetes to a variety of chronic health problems, uh, including Alzheimer's disease, vascular dementia. And I also wanted to thank you for noting that although a person may experience cognitive decline, may not be able to do all the things that she or, or he uh, were, uh, was able to do before, those individuals, their spirit, their, their humanity, has not changed. And they have a lot to offer, even when those particular problems, when those cognitive decline problems emerge. Certainly. Appreciate you stating that at the end of your presentation. How sensitive and thoughtful of you. And now we have Tamika Norton Brown. Good evening, everyone. And what I'm going to do is to give information on our Acts 2 project and about resources that are available in the community. Um, as both Dr. Coleman and Dr. Hart stated, you know, there are changes that need to be made. But if you are the one who's in the position of providing those changes or making those adjustments for your loved ones, um, it can get to be very difficult. So what we want to do is to Talk about some resources that are available to help you take care of yourself as you're caring for your loved one. Next slide, please. Um, our Acts 2 project, um, we have three primary objectives. Um, we do serve all of the state of Florida. Um, our, one of our objectives is to optimize the access, uptake, and effectiveness of faith-based skills, training, and support for distressed African-American caregivers of older adults with dementia. We want to participate in things such as this Facebook Live tonight. We want to increase dementia awareness and knowledge through presentations and workshops at faith community and elder care venues, as well as through print and social media. And thirdly, we provide brief telephone-based consultation and referral services to African-American dementia caregivers and other stakeholders. Next slide, please. Um, what I'm going to do is give an overview of our Acts 2 program, but there are a couple of things that I want to make sure to include. Um, in order to participate in our um, Acts 2 program, um, you have to be a relative caregiver, and we loosely define the term relative. So we, you can be caring for a neighbor down the street that you love as your aunt. If you consider that person to be your aunt, then we consider that to be your relative. So you have to be an African-American caregiver, um, African-American relative caregiver, I'm sorry, spend six hours a week in caregiving duties, which does not mean the person has to live in the home with you. They can be in a nursing home, or as I just stated, they can live down the street. As long as you're spending at least six hours in care, we count that. Um, so if it's stopping by and taking them food or making sure that clothes are washed or making doctor's appointments, we count all of that for as caregiving. And as a caregiver, you have to be experiencing distress in your caregiving duties. And there's a measure that I use um, to get that determination. I will also state that Acts 2 is free 
faith-based, which means that we have just woven in elements such as scripture, um, prayer, meditation, and faith sharing into the actual groups. But we're also ecumenical, so we're open to everyone. And the 12 session program is for African Americans, but anyone who calls us, we will absolutely make sure that we connect you to resources in the community. We will absolutely make sure that we are giving you the help that you need. Um, so for our program description, our 12 session program includes seven group skills building sessions, three persons in a group and five individual sessions. All sessions are delivered weekly over a toll-free telephone um, system. So there's absolutely no cost to participate. And we even use a toll-free um, telephone line. So there's no cost incurred in that as well. Um, those five individual sessions with the facilitators will focus on goal setting and problem solving. Um, so any concerns that you have come in with, um, whether they be caregiver related or whether they be personal, you get five weeks where you get to work one-on-one -on -one with that facilitator. And that is important because a lot of times we see caregivers in doctor's offices. We see them at church. We see them out in the community with their loved ones. And everyone always asks that caregiver, well, how's your mom doing? Or how's your aunt doing? Or how's your uncle doing? But they forget that there's an entire person behind the scenes who, as we say, are doing the heavy lifting. So they get five weeks where they get to focus on things that are important to them. Next slide, please. Okay, our program consists of six major components. Um, the first is the overview of the basic characteristics of the dementia, so what we refer to as Dementia 101. There is relaxation training that's combined with prayer and or meditation. There's this whole myth that relaxing just means going home and getting in your favorite chair, when in actuality, we actually teach our caregivers to be able to fully enter into relaxation, calming the mind, calming the spirit, calming the body. Um, and then there's also effective thinking about the challenges of caregiving that are coupled with scripture, just changing the way that you think about your caregiving situation. Next slide, please. Um, we also have, which is my favorite, I, I like to refer to it as the me time module, um, which is building in pleasant daily activities as a guard against emotional distress. Just being able to navigate and have 15 minutes that you can take a walk or listen to some, to some gospel music. Um, we also teach communicating effectively with the care partner with dementia family and health professionals and then developing um, effective problem solving skills that i spoke about earlier through personal goal setting next slide please um what i'm now going to do is talk about some resources that are available um we have the alzheimer's association the alzheimer's foundation of america the florida department of elder affairs the elder helpline the Elder Care Locator, and the Alzheimer's Disease Education and Referral Center. Next slide, please. Um, how can caregivers contact the X2 Project? Many, many ways to contact us. Um, you're here on our Facebook page, so you can always contact us um, through our Facebook page. We have a toll-free number, 866-778-2724. My local cell phone number, local to Tallahassee, 850 Two seven four four nine four five, and that toll free number rolls over to my um, cell phone number. We have my email address, tnnorton at fsu.edu. And if any of you pre registered for this, I've been emailing you back and forth. So you can also, you know, you can contact me on that email address. Um, what we are going to do is we're going to bring up our Acts 2 project website. If you will go to links, please. On the links tab to our website, we have useful links that are for Florida and um, nationally. So there are very good resources that are on that page. Um, if you will go to caregiver resources. Okay. On our caregiver resources, we have included things that we felt would be helpful. So we have prayers. We have information on the basics of dementia, including the fact sheets. We have information on some of the things I spoke about before, like coping with agitation and those type things, links to all of those caregiver skills type information. 
If you will now click on donate, please. Okay. Um, the X2 program is primarily funded by grants and investments from the faith community and private donors. So if you would like to get more information on how we're funded or potentially donate yourself, you can feel free to go and check out our donate page. And lastly, if you would click on sign up. Um, here on this page, it, of course, has there again, all of my contact information. And if you have a question or if you're just uncomfortable making a phone call and would rather contact me through the website, you can go to this page, enter your information. It will route to my email address. Um, I try very hard to make sure that I contact everyone who reaches out to us. Um and so we thank you so very much. And the next thing we're going to do is we're going to have a panel discussion. We know that there were quite a few questions um, that you all had. So we want to make sure that we dedicate and take a couple of minutes to answer some of those questions. So thank you very much. Thank you, Tamika. Thank you, Dr. Hart. Thank you, Dr. Coleman. This has been one powerful workshop, so informative, so thoughtful, and with great examples of not only in the office, but in the community and, and, um, and your own experiences in dealing with loved ones with dementia and uh, the persons uh, who are in your office who are both care partners and persons with dementia. So let's have a few questions for our esteemed panel. From Vicki Rose. Are people with diabetes at higher risk of getting Alzheimer's? Dr. Yes. Hart, Dr. Coleman, which of Yes, diabetes and particularly poorly controlled diabetes increases the risk of Alzheimer's disease. Thank you so much. Dr. Hart, other questions? What is a good ALC number? The A1C number should be set individually between patient and provider. So uh, the target for young adults is uh, up to seven, six and a half to seven. Um, but for many older adults, that number may be too restrictive and may result in undue hypoglycemia, low blood sugar. So it's important to sit down with your provider and find out what your individual target is. Sorry, I misspoke. I thought it was written ALC. I know it's HbA1c. Thank you. <laughs> Good catch. Could could I say something as yes, well? Yes, of course, Doctor. Okay, Coleman. so what what we what we do at Healing Our Village is we really focus a lot on people testing. Doctor Hart so eloquently talked about the importance of monitoring. You got to know your numbers. So when you get up in the morning, you know that that morning blood sugar with with no food on board, so fasting needs to be between ninety and one thirty. Closer to ninety, a uh, hundred is better. And then throughout the day, we want you to really be within that 140 to 160 range. In order to get to that A1C that Dr. Hart just mentioned, which is if you're younger, uh, seven or less, if you're older, you know, se between seven and 7.5, you have to have pretty low, pretty tight sugars. They need to be as close to normal as possible. So you need to be testing your sugar at least in the morning and then Initially, when I'm working with patients, I have them do it a couple times a day, uh, sometimes after breakfast, after lunch, sometimes after dinner, and then I can then figure out how to make adjustments in their medicines based upon those numbers. So if you bring your little meter back to your doctor, Dr. Hart's very happy when her patients, I'm sure, walks in with their meters and have memory so she can look at their numbers and figure out what their mean and our average numbers have been throughout the day. That's how we'll know what they're doing and what they're eating that may be driving their numbers up. We have another question from Ms. Andrews. What is a good number in the AM and how many times throughout the day should you check your blood sugar? Well, um, I, Again, any that other has thoughts? To be individualized. So 
Um, for young adults, we might set a target of 70 to 120. Uh, but for our senior patients, especially if there's some memory decline, we might not feel comfortable with it much below 100. So it's something that you ought to talk to talk about to your health care provider and see what they feel is appropriate for you. Thank you, Dr. Hart. Constant Pierce Lackey, affirmations for the for the workshop team. Thank you all for such a wonderful workshop. Thank you. Thank Barbara Lane has a comment. I took the program and it was a tremendous help. May need a refresher. Thank you, Barbara Lane. We appreciate your your feedback on Acts 2. Hattie Mary Young, thank you, Hattie Mary, for being with us today. Uh, she also wants to give uh, positive feedback to the workshop crew. Thank you very much to both presenters for this wonderful information. Vicki Rose, once again, would you advise a feeding tube for someone with dementia who is not eating? That's certainly an option to be considered there. Uh, it, you would want to make sure all other avenues have been tried before going to something so uh, invasive. Uh, so it's, again, something you would sit down and discuss with your provider to decide if it's time to take that step. But it's, a, it's certainly an option. Thank you. Great information, Ms. Brown. There you go. A little bit of a positive for Tamika Norton Brown. And Annie Knight, thank you. Thank you, Annie. Luis Porches, great information. Very helpful. Thanks for all you're doing. Time for one final thought. I have a question that I would like to ask real quickly of of Dr. Coleman and, and Dr. Hart for in, in glucose monitoring, monitoring for uh, diabetes control, what suggestions do you have for enhancing the likelihood that your loved one with dementia, dementia will cooperate with monitoring? Um, well, you know, I, I think that um, if the person doesn't really want to do it, then it, it it really takes some a lot of uh, you know coaxing and education. If they have a caregiver, um, that person can actually do the the do the help with the monitoring. Maybe they don't want to stick their finger. So Dr. Hart actually showed a meter that you don't it doesn't require a finger stick. A lot of people don't like the the, the sticking of the fingers. And so I always try to figure out what why patients don't want to monitor. Because it's it's really important, especially as it relates to the nutrition and the foods that they're eating. Because with diabetes, you're really trying to watch your carbohydrate intake, those sugars, those starches, and so and you need to know certain starches affect your sugar more than other starches, and so that's why it's so important. So you know what we try to do is just you know get, lead by example. I, we're really involved right now at Healing Our Village with what we call remote patient monitoring. So people actually are able to do their blood pressures and their blood sugars at home and they can see the results on their phone. Well, that's also super good for their caretakers and their families and their doctors. So that means now everybody is privy to the numbers by doing this remote patient monitoring. So technology has really, I think, uh, added a lot to us as it relates to getting people under better diabetes control. Dr. Hart, your thoughts, please. You know, it's worth pointing out that there's some people who are just not going to monitor and there are ancillary things we can do to get information about where their blood sugar is. In particular, if they're only on medicines that don't cause low blood sugar, so that's not a, an issue. If they've been well controlled, their A1C is in range and you do a finger stick if they come in the office, you do a lab glucose when they go to get their quarterly lab or however often you're doing it. And sometimes that 
those pieces of the puzzle reaffirm each other and you feel pretty confident that the patient is doing well. And if they're just adamant about it and it's a source of uh, angst, sometimes we, we do forego it. Thank you. Well, uh, Laura Copeland, thank you, Laura. This was fantastic. Uh, Buddha and Victor Jackson, thank you all for a great presentation full of information we can use. Sharon Eland, or Island, thank you, panel. Now it's time for one, one final thought from each of you. Let's start with, uh, with, with you, Dr. Coleman. Um, yeah, I think that I would just like to leave the audience with the knowledge that um, you can take small little baby steps on this healthy eating and nutrition. You don't have to do everything at one time. Just make one or two changes. What I, I really want people to do initially when we first get started is stop drinking your calories. So whatever you're drinking needs to have no more than five calories. Zero calories is better. Water or some of the drinks that are out there that are sugar-free, I think are so important. Here in, I'm in Georgia and you're down there in Florida and, you know, way, way too much sweet tea being drank and sometimes <laughs> coming. So we got to really watch what we're drinking. And if we can do that, we can watch our portions um, and then the other thing in terms of our caretakers is just try to be patient um, and, you know, try to understand that it's, it's tough when you don't remember where you, you parked your car and you used to be this really highly functioning person that could remember everything. It's tough. So we got to be patient and understanding. Amen. Dr. Hart, please. Uh, well, I think that you know everybody seems so receptive to this evening's program and it's important to take advantage of programs such as this and other programs that are available in your community uh, and interact with other people who are going through similar situations uh, because there's a lot you can learn uh, sharing that way will really enhance your understanding and your insight into some of what's going on so uh, keep it up. Thanks for participating tonight. Thank you. And finally, Mrs. Tamika Norton Brown. Um, my final thought would be, and I, I always like to speak directly to the caregivers, um, is to just know that you are doing the very best you can under very difficult circumstances. And nobody expects you to get it right all the time. Um, the great thing about falling down is you have the opportunity to get back up. So take advantage of resources that are available to you. There is no shame in saying to somebody that today's a bad day and I need a little bit of help. So reach out to us. If you don't know where to start, start with me. I offer myself as a resource um, and I will plug you into as many of the resources that are available Um in your community. So just know that you're doing the best you can with what you have. Well, thank you, Tamika. Just a final thought from yours truly. Uh, please follow us on the Acts to Caregiver, uh, Caregiver Project website. Our next workshop will highlight, will highlight the lived experiences of black dementia care partners, hearing about their lessons learned their faith walks in providing care for a loved one with dementia, their rewards and challenges. We will soon announce the date of, of this workshop in the Acts to Caregiver Project Facebook website. So please look for that because we really, as Tamika said, uh, and Dr. Coleman and uh, Dr. Hart emphasized that uh, we need to honor the efforts of care partners of older adults with dementia and other chronic health conditions. The next month's workshop, you will be hearing directly from those care partners, their lived experiences, their challenges, uh, their rewards, and in, in many cases, how their faith tradition led them to have the power for the hour when the going got rough. 
So thank you so much. We appreciate your involvement uh, in the Acts 2 workshop this evening. And we thank Dr. Coleman, Dr. Hart, and Tamika Norton Brown for their outstanding contributions. Good evening, folks, and God bless. Thank you.